Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Okay, <laughs> I'm getting some messages that say you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Friday. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so today I do have some handouts um, that are I, I uploaded handouts. So if you look on the, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure what it looks like on your computer, but in the like task bar, it's not really a bar, it's a, the thing, okay, the thing. <laughs> that has questions and polls and all of that stuff on it, there's a little um, tab that says handouts. And it's five out of five. So I uploaded a bunch of research papers. <laughs> Courtney said it's the control panel. Yes, the control panel. If you look at the control panel, um, there are some handouts on there for you guys, okay? Um, today we're going to talk about IP staffing first. So anyway, that's for you. I know some of us uh, struggle to get access to papers and have to ask friends for, you know, for them to print them out for us if they have a university account, etc. But some of us may not. So, okay, enough about that. Let's, let's, just, let's just keep it moving. Okay, so today we're going to talk about infection prevention staffing and then we're going to do a chapter 12. So let's see how much of this I can actually get through. I feel like my timing has not been on point um, recently as of late. And hopefully I won't have any issues like I did last week. All right, so infection prevention program infrastructure cute little germs. The things we're going to talk about today is infection prevention program responsibilities infection prevention staffing, infrastructure overview, and recommendations. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when I put this presentation together, the, the purpose of the presentation was to discuss with leadership and to discuss with um, um, our directors, et cetera, people that we report to, um, what IPs do. So what do we do? What are we responsible for? Um, basically everything that encompasses the role. So while you're an infection preventionist and you may already know what we do, uh, this is just to provide more of an overview because if we're being honest, there's a lot of people who don't really know what we do. They know who we are, right? They know who we are, but some people just assume, oh, well, all they do is hand hygiene or all they do is tell me when I have an infection or all they do is X, Y, and Z, but we do a lot. And so this is this is the... The audience, just to put that in perspective. All right, so infection prevention department responsibilities. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, break down our responsibilities, and this is just the way that I chose to do it, which I felt um, just displayed everything that we do in a, a way that's easy to digest. So, the categories that I chose um, are education and rounding, surveillance, reporting, and data analysis hand hygiene and multidisciplinary collaboration, audits, and public health. So under each bubble, I basically touched on some things that IPs do. So for education and rounding, we do device-associated rounding. You know, we check our lines, foleys, et cetera, nursing and staff education, policy and procedures. Um, we, we go a lot over policy. A lot of people are, a lot of people call and ask, what's the policy on this? What's the policy on that? Um, we get those types of questions. Um, all the time from different departments. It's from different departments throughout the entire hospital. So EVS may call you, hey, what's the procedure when it comes to HEPA filters? Do, are we supposed to clean it and take it out of the room? Does nursing do it? Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions all the time related to infection prevention. Case review, environment of care, observing um, and observing patient care, and then ICU and unit rounds for surveillance and reporting. You have reporting infections to NHSN, obviously, uh, CLABC, CAUTI, VAE, and SSIs, HOC divs, lab ID events like MRSA, you know, bacteremias, reviewing all positive microbiology labs, facility-wide, including outpatient sites, and then root cause analysis, you know, that's another fun thing. For hand hygiene and multidisciplinary collaboration, we have hand hygiene data collection, 
um, how many of you guys have electronic hand hygiene monitoring? Like, I'm always curious. Anybody? So Shelly does. Kim does. Do you like it? Do you like the electronic? Shelly says yes, she does. Um, and Kim, <laughs> you get a thumbs up. Um, so yes, electronic is is. There's definitely people out there who are using it. Our campus does not. Our campus doesn't doesn't have electronic hand hygiene monitoring, but I know other people do. Um, training of hand hygiene champions, uh, ATP testing, EVS activities, and microbial stewardship rounds for audits. This is another area that we. Honestly, I feel like audits provide us an opportunity to develop relationships with people that we don't regularly see or that we're working with all the time. You have ambulatory surgical centers, outpatient sites, dialysis sites, imaging, um, endoscopy. You also do audits with with quality or patient safety and high reliability. Um, there's a lot of collaboration. And then lastly, public health. We have to report out all the reportables and that's a lot of work. Luckily for our system, we actually have someone um, that's dedicated to that for all of the different campuses. They work from a centralized location and assist us with reporting that stuff out. Then outbreak response, global epidemics and pandemics, which we're in the middle of one, uh, regulatory preparation and water management programs. So we do a lot. Uh, and I hope that this slide really conveys, this slide really conveys a lot of what we do. Um, and if I have anybody from public health or epidemiology um, that's also, who may be interested in what is an IP, what do they do, and they haven't had the opportunity to shadow or they haven't reached out yet to a local hospital, um, I highly recommend it. You know, if, if you think that IP is something that you like, reach out to your local hospital, see if you're able to shadow um, and get an idea of what, what the role is like. But we do a lot of different things. Okay, so how has our role changed? So infection prevention programs of the 1970s and early 1990s. For the scope of the program, they focused on infectious disease events. And now um, we're focusing on other quality and safety outcomes like surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis, leading immunization for patients in employee occupational health programs, and preparedness, such as pandemic planning. The scope of surveillance. So primarily it was in the acute care setting, often intensive care units, and now it has expanded into non-intensive care unit settings, as well as ambulatory settings. For laboratory consultations, you have daily review of laboratory tests, microbiology, virology, serology, fungal results available in days or weeks. And now we have PCR, which is available within hours for rapid and targeted therapy um, institution of precautions if indicated. Data collection, medical record review abstracted from paper and chart review. And now we have data mining of electronic medical records with flagging capabilities of possible HAIs, which is Pretty awesome. I mean, there's been some really great advances. And then for environmental rounding, so it was primarily done to meet regulatory requirements, and now that's expanded into risk assessments, injection safety practices, hand hygiene compliance, um, evaluation of sterilization and high level disinfection practices, and quality assurance of environmental cleaning. So there's definitely a lot a lot that we're doing and it's exciting. It's exciting. I, I love my job and I hope that all the other IPs on the call also love their jobs. So this is from the Society of Healthcare Epidemiologists of America. These are some of the essential activities for infection prevention and control programs. Surveillance, we know surveillance. Surveillance is really important. Epis know about it, IPs know about it. It's a lot, we do a lot of reviewing, looking at charts, looking at, you know, microbiology reports, seeing if they meet for infections. So surveillance does take up a significant amount of our time. Performance improvements to reduce healthcare associated infections, uh, acute event response, including outbreak investigation. This is definitely in an acute, we're in an acute event. We're having to pull from a lot of different departments and resources to respond to the pandemic. Education and training of both healthcare personnel and patients. 
I think patience being a, a big one, um, a big opportunity there. So obviously we're involved with education of our healthcare personnel, but um, you know, I really do wish that I had more time to be able to spend with, with patients. Reporting of healthcare associated infections to CDC's NHSN. Some epis. So I remember when I was when I was a an epidemiologist at the county level, we had access to data through NHSN, but I never really um, it was used more at the state level rather than the local level, like at the county level. Um, but I had listened to the trainings in order to get access to NHSN, but I didn't really know what NHSN did till I became an IP. Um, so in public health, you use different reporting systems. Um, but for the hospitals, we use NHSN, which is where we input all of our infections if something is meaning for a CLABSI, a CAUTI, an SSI, et cetera. So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, just know that it's a type of reporting program that's able to track data and um, where you basically input your data to submit all of your events. So what are the resources necessary for infection prevention programs? The personnel, physical, and financial resources required for an effective IPCHE program should be proportional to the size, sophistication, case mix, and estimated infection risk of the populations served by the institution. This is an important bullet point because I feel that even with all of the, the papers, the research, the surveys that have gone out, um, one thing that remains really constant throughout them is that you need to do an assessment of your own individual facility to determine what type of resources are necessary for an infection prevention program. Hospitals provide different levels of care, right? Let's be honest. I mean, if you, there's a difference between a trauma center and a small rural hospital, there's there are big differences. There's a difference between a rural hospital and academic center. And not just not just in culture, not just in the type of services provided, but your patient populations. Your patient populations are going to be different. We don't do transplants at my hospital. They do transplants at other places. That's that's a completely different type of patient population that we're talking about. So you you need to look at what type of services am I providing? What type of patients am I taking care of? And you need to do that um, at a facility at a facility or a system level in order to really be able to determine what type of resources I would need. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that is really important that we can't just, we can't just say, oh, well, this is, this is what, what we should have because this is what the recommendation is. Um, because in all of the papers, they put that in there that you really need to, to do an assessment of your facility. The individuals responsible for leadership of the program must be clearly identified and have significant access to key organizational leaders and clinical decision makers. And this is very important. I'm very, very happy at the facility that I am at. I have a very good relationship and a direct line to my CNO. That's who we directly report to. So that is something that I am very fulfilled with. But I know that that's not the case for all IPs. Um, some IPs are not actively involved with leadership and, and part of really important committees. And so um, this is important. If, if you don't have those relationships established and if, you, um, if, if your department isn't coming to the table, right, that's a problem. That's a problem for the facility and for your patients and for your staff. Infection prevention personnel should work closely with senior leadership when addressing quality assessment and performance improvement. All right, so let's talk about infection prevention staffing through the years. So in, 1980, in 1985, the study on the efficacy of nosocomial infections recommended, an, recommended one IP resource to 250 acute care beds. Now I know for a fact that there are facilities out there with these ratio, like with this ratio right here, one IP to 250 acute care beds. Um, know that for a fact. So we're talking about Back in 1985, where our where our roles were still, um, ooh, okay, why are you getting crazy? I apologize. Um, I must have hit the something. So, um, sorry. Let me gather my thoughts. So back in 1985, um, our roles were different than what they are now. And so maybe you could have gotten away with one IP resource to 250 acute care beds, but that's most definitely not the case now in 2020. 
but I wanted to put in one slide what the recommendations are and what the surveys have shown over time so that we can get an idea of what, what these ratios look like. Um, in 2002, we had a study recommending an IP staffing ratio of one full-time employee per 100 to 167 beds, and this is what I'm most commonly seeing for different types of um, healthcare facilities, the one IP to 100 to 167. And this may be where you are right now, where you have just one IP somewhere in between that, that acute care bed ratio. An important thing to note is a lot of these staffing ratios, um, most definitely prior to 2000, 2018, focused on your acute care beds. So they're focusing on an acute care bed and what that means for your ratio, which is not encompassing everything that we do in infection prevention because we are most definitely not only responsible for every for what's inside the hospital walls, but a lot of us have additional duties and outpatient responsibilities. So in 2009, we have a web survey that was submitted through NHSN, which revealed a median staffing of one IP per 167 beds. So this is a survey that was distributed out to infection preventionists, and this is the results that they got back. So once again, we're not focusing on recommendations. This is just what we have. What we have is one to 167. This is what is actually going on on the ground, um, regardless of whatever recommendations have been out there. Then in 2015, we have a review of literature conducted, um, which recommends a ratio of one full-time employee per 100 acute care beds. So again, focusing on those acute care beds, which doesn't encompass everything that we do. Um, but I feel like this is this is a little bit of this is a little bit more manageable um, than when you're getting into those one to over 150 beds or 200 beds. Um, at that point, I, I just don't know how you can safely um, safely practice infection prevention with that amount of with that amount of beds, and who knows what else added on top of that. In 2018, we had data from an APIC mega survey, which is now revealing an overall media, uh, median of IP staffing of 1.25 per 100 inpatient uh, census. So again, focusing on your acute care beds. And then in 2018, a new benchmark of one infection prevention full-time equivalent per 69 beds if ambulatory, long-term care, or home care are included. And I really think that this study down here 2000, from 2018 is the future of infection prevention. I think that as more people learn what we do, and this pandemic has 1000% highlighted the importance of our roles, they're going to take into consideration that we are not solely responsible for the acute care beds within our hospital, but also other services that may be provided in the hospital and outside of the hospital, and that that needs to be accounted for as part of our workload. Is accounting for acute care beds enough? IP staffing have historically been set based on the ratio of IP full-time employees to acute care beds. Staffing models based on hospital bed size alone do not account for other important factors such as the size and scope of outpatient responsibilities. As health systems seek to expand their care delivery models for IP staffing should include ambulatory surgical centers and other outpatient areas such as specialized care facilities and primary care offices. Novel infection prevention and control staffing that includes both infection preventionists and role specific support staff are needed to meet the evolving infection prevention and control needs and challenges of expanding healthcare networks. And support staff is something that I'm actually very highly interested in um, because I think that we could be really growing and training um, just a, a, quite a large workforce if we were able to implement support roles within infection prevention programs and we got away from only solely focusing on oh it's an IP I need an IP you don't always um, need infection preventionists for all aspects of our roles um, I can guarantee you that there are things that you would be able to pass off to another colleague or to another team member who maybe did not have um, your credentials who maybe doesn't have a master's in public health or is a nurse and I think that there's a lot to be said for what type of support these um, um, these different roles can provide. 
And then in 2012, New York State proposed an acute care bed equivalent equation to account for the broad responsibilities of IPs in both the inpatient and outpatient setting. And let's look at that. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. Some of you may have seen this. Um, some of you may have not. But uh, this is the staffing ratios. So in 2012, New York State wanted to find a way to really adjust um, their acute care beds and outpatient and have a way to account for all of it. And this is the acute care bed equivalent equation-ish that they came up with. So an acute care bed is going to be one. If you have an intensive care bed, that's going to be two acute care beds. The ICU requires a significant amount of surveillance. Um, this is where our sickest patients are. You have patients who are on vents, central lines, flexa seals, foleys. You have just a tremendous amount of opportunities for infections to develop. And um, I can definitely understand why they're saying that that each ICU bed really accounts for two, because um, it's 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 a completely different ball game once you get to the ICU. A long-term care bed accounts for half of an acute care bed. And then your dialysis facilities would equal 50. Your ambulatory surgery centers would be 50. An ambulatory clinic would be 10. And then a private physician office would be five. So you should already start, depending on your facility and what you're responsible for, you should already kind of start thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm responsible for not only this whole place, this whole hospital, but we also have a dialysis facility that I'm responsible for and, um, you know, an ambulatory surgery center, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about, did I skip ahead again? Okay, sorry. Let's talk about this paper, a strategy for expanding infection prevention resources to support organizational growth. Now, again, this is in the handouts in the control panel. Um, now that I know the name for that, the control panel has the handouts, so you'll find it in there. So let's talk about Sarah Smathers and her colleagues, um, colleague Julia, and what they and what they published. So the Infection Prevention and Control Department of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia underwent modifications to a staffing structure between 2014 and 2018. Um, they modified the New York State's acute care bed equivalent equation to guide the expansion of their program, meaning that they just made and tweaked a little bit of the equation to better suit what they, what they felt was appropriate, but they still um, used the acute care bed equivalent um, from New York State to, to guide them. They revised and updated job descriptions to include promotion, promotional criteria, career ladders, and supporting roles. And this is, I think, really important. Um, I don't know, for, for those of us in infection prevention, I think that one of the frustrations that I commonly hear is that they feel like there's no growth in the role. Um, because once you're an IP, well, where do you really have to go, right? Um, and that's something that I've heard not only from infection preventionists, but also from people in leadership. So who are within higher roles asking, well, what is your next step? There's really not much to do after being an IP. Um, are you planning on coming over to safety? Are you, um, you know, do you have any plans for any additional department or, growth because once you're an IP, you're an IP. So I think that they were really, really um, not only creative, but but I, I think it's I think it's something that other um, hospitals need to look at because I think having a career ladder and those opportunities for growth for infection prevention is is, is great. They also created unique job descriptions, increasing from four to nine, creating that three-tiered career ladder, um, and increasing their full-time equivalents from 8.2 to 11.6. Additional support roles, including a hand hygiene program manager, infection prevention associates, and clinical practice analysts were also created. And over this time period, their total HI index decreased by 23%, and they had a significant decrease in their CLAPSIs, CAUDIs, SSI, VAEs, and HAIs. So if we look at um, what they did, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, 
you can see here the the equation so the acute care bed equivalent which is modified um, one of the modifications you can see here for dialysis facility under new york state it's equal to 50 acute care beds but for them they made it 25. Um, they made they added a specialty care center category um, and you know they added some additional care locations down here providing them a 25 bed acute care bed equivalent so you can definitely see that there were some modifications, but they still use the bones of the acute care bed equivalent um, equation from New York State to really guide them. So this is what they came up with. Down here you have their total adjusted acute care bed equivalent and their adjusted IP staffing ratios um, and then their adjusted IP staffing ratios plus their support roles and one to 109. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty, pretty good. Here you can see their organizational growth from 2014 all the way to 2018. So you can see how um, throughout the years they started adding in those roles, um, those support roles, and then how they created that career ladder from you know IP1 to IP2, senior IP, IP supervisor. Um, and they actually created an entire ambulatory and procedure team, which is really, which is really great. All right, and then the next study we're gonna talk about is a systematic approach to quantifying infection prevention staffing coverage needs. So Providence Health and Service is a large not-for-profit Catholic healthcare organization comprised of 34 hospitals and more than 580 physician clinics, long-term care facilities, senior services, in-home services, supportive housing, and many other health and educational services. So they're pretty large. They were divided into nine regions. And in 2016, they were asked to conduct a system-wide assessment of their IP staffing ratios. So this is what prompted them looking at what their staffing models look like and what they felt was appropriate. They, um, the infection prevention and control full-time employee needs of the system as a whole were underrepresented by 66% when they used a lower staffing ratio of 0.5 FTEs per 100 beds and then by 31% when they used a higher staffing ratio benchmark of one per 100 beds which I think is the one that most people are familiar with of the one um, full-time employee per 100 beds. When aggregated across the organization, the comprehensive review results yielded a new benchmark of one full-time employee per 69 beds for the enterprise, including all care settings requiring infection prevention and control oversight. So you can see that once you're adding those additional roles, ambulatory care, long-term care, uh, dialysis, everything else, you're having, um, you're having that ratio lowered because of the amount of different um, activities and responsibilities that, that you'll have. So this is their staffing models um, that they came up with. So obviously every facility is not going to have the same needs and that's when it's important to consult, do your own um, comparisons and determine what is appropriate. So I really like this graph because I feel like well, it's it's more of a um, it's more of a it's not more it's not a graph it's a what is this called I can't think today but if you look at facility one they have a manager role two IPs and then an administrative role right so you have a support role within within this facility for the second facility you have an infection preventionist and an administrative role. So this is probably a smaller campus, maybe 100, 125 beds. We're not really sure, but it's definitely somewhat smaller um, to where, you know, I honestly don't need two IPs for 125 beds, but I can have a support role that assists with all different types of activities, data entry, hand hygiene observations, environment of care, a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different things that they could assist with. And then you have facility three, where you have two IPs and an admin, very similar to facility one. And then facility five, they said, no, we, we need all IPs. So you can see the different types of staffing um, that they came up with um, and that they created in order to be able to address their needs. And here for their, for their region, they had an ambulatory and long-term care IP, a project manager, and then somebody really focusing on regional high-level disinfection and sterilization which I think is fantastic. I think that is fantastic um, because some of the locations where you find 
a lot of opportunities for improvement is that high level disinfection and sterilization, 100%. So some key takeaways, the actual demand for infection prevention and control services is significantly higher than even the highest staffing ratio benchmark, revealing a gap of which most IPs are acutely aware. Available peer review literature presents staffing as a ratio of IPs to inpatient beds, which does not consider the complex nature of the work and the varying degree of acuity and risk in different care settings. A percentage of surveillance activities could be accomplished by a lesser skilled individual, leaving additional time for the IP to interact in patient care areas. And if I could highlight this, I would um, 100%. I agree with this 1,000%. Um, like for sure. It is necessary to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the composition of a healthcare organization prior to determining the IP staffing needs for that specific organization. All right, diversifying roles and creating support staff benefits the team by increasing the productivity of the department and providing a deeper bench so that IPs can focus on broader activities requiring specific subject matter expertise. And I think that, I mean, this is like a future that I envision really with IP programs expanding and us having um, varying roles within our within our department and not having everything just be infection prevention focused. I think that there is a place for an infection prevention associate and infection prevention technician. I think that we can grow people within this career. I know that you guys um, have read the papers and you've seen um, postings on AGIC where they're talking about um, you know, the age of retirement for a lot of the infection preventionists that are coming up because we have a lot of, um, you know, people within that retirement age working in specifically within our field. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities for growth relating to infection prevention. I think that it's a difficult position to, to get. There's a lot of expertise and I 100% agree that IPs need to be, need to have experience, they need to be certified, um, but I think that we don't need every team member to be an IP. And we can agree to disagree on that for those of you who feel um, differently. So this is from Sarah Smathers' paper. So I don't, I wasn't able to upload that because I had a maximum of five <laughs> five files I could upload, um, but I can send this out as a, actually no, because then the email will bounce back. So I'll just have to upload it to the drive. But this is examples of the, the infection preventionist summaries, sorry, role summaries that she presented in, in their paper the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. So for an infection preventionist one, responsible for all aspects of the infection prevention and control domain, including surveillance, chart review, data abstraction and collection, as well as assisting with outbreak investigations, education and rounding. Other competencies are developed to include education program design, policy and procedures review, and participation in performance improvement activities to promote patient safety. You need to have a bachelor's degree in nursing, public health, biology, or other related healthcare field, um, a master's degree in a scientifically relevant field, and then a certi you're, you need certified to be certified within two years of employment, and then minimum of two years experience as a healthcare professional preferred. Then you jump into tier two, which is very similar, but then you're putting in leadership roles. So now you're leading outbreak investigations and you're more of a resource for your team. Then we have the infection prevention associate, uh, which is responsible for data management, data entry, and data reports for the purposes of public health reporting, external benchmarking and performance improvement projects, maintains department data, assists in the development of internal auditing tools, and manages the data collected by the department and builds reports for data dissemination. And then you have a bachelor's degree that's required, certification is not required, um, but they do prefer that you work within, uh, within healthcare for three to five years and have some um, experience with data management. The clinical practice analyst, this is this is actually a really interesting role. Um, they assist with training, coaching, and feedback of unit-based clinical auditors and other healthcare workers and ensure high reliability across the organization. So I think that this type of this type of um, position is a blend between like education and IP and quality and safety. So that I love that. That type of role is fantastic. Then we have the infection prevention technician. Now the technician role is different um, depending on where you look and what facility you're looking into. But the infection prevention technician um, is really a 100% a support role. 
And the way that they use them in this specific uh, article on AJIC was to really assist with their environment of care rounding. But you can see that other places, because this is an example of a position description, they're using them for um, not only environment of care rounds in clinical and non-clinical areas, but uh, um, assisting IPs for monthly, um, preparing in monthly meetings, um, assisting with department risk assessments, by rounding in renovation areas and other nursing units, answering phones, assisting with basic surveillance and activities assigned by the IP. So there's a lot of different opportunities and you can go a lot of different ways with the role. And for this one, there's an education, a high, a high school diploma or equivalent. All right, so let's talk about COVID-19 impacts on infection prevention responsibilities. So this is a survey that was distributed by 3M that accounts for some of the some of the issues, some of the challenges that we're facing with an infection prevention. So when asked about current priorities and areas of focus, 84% of respondents reference pandemic response or recovery as a top priority. Uh, I think that we can all agree on that. We can all 100% agree that COVID-19 took over our jobs since March, basically. Um, like just came in and said, I'm here, you need to pay attention to me right now and everything else is going to have to wait. I don't know how many of you felt that pressure, but especially if you worked in the hospital as an IP, if you worked in public health, you, you must have felt it because it was tremendous. 36% um, of respondents said administration and our leadership support was needed. 94% of respondents said COVID-19 had impacted their approach to infection prevention. And 41% of respondents said keeping up with ongoing infection prevention activities, including healthcare associated infection protocols and education was challenging. So do, do you guys feel that this survey is reflecting some of your feelings? You may have participated in it, you may have not, um, but I definitely felt like our challenges and my feelings towards our role were reflected in this survey. So I'm getting a lot of yes, oh yes, yes I agree, yes it did. Um, definitely, I, I think that we can all agree that the survey is, is a reflection of the struggle bus we've all been on. And Roberta says, COVID has taken over my entire workload. Just say, let's just say that one more time for the people in the back. COVID has taken over. All right. What were the biggest contributors of cross contamination at your facility? So, pre pandemic, staff non compliance to existing infection prevention protocols, about 88%. And during the pandemic, improper use of personal protective equipment. Yeah, can we talk about that? Can we talk about PPE? That has been a challenge. That has been a challenge, 100%. Where do you focus the majority of your time? So pre-pandemic, surveillance and reporting. And then during the pandemic, is strategies and protocols focused on source of contamination that may lead to infection. I think that... Um, I think that I 100% agree to agree with the pre-pandemic and the during pandemic here as well because these strategies and protocols this is this is everything that we've been doing right um, how do we conserve PPE how do we do decontamination of N95s how do we ensure staff know exactly how to put on their gowns and doff their gowns um, COVID setting up COVID units setting up personal protective equipment stations um, all of this right all of this is encompassed in that and the problem is that you have to do it all, right? You have to do it all. Um, and then uh, Rosalind said, staying up to date with CDC guidelines also. Yeah, 100%, um, keeping in mind that they change. I don't know, do you guys remember? I know you guys remember, it was literally like two months ago when every other week or two weeks we were getting updated guidelines. Um, this has changed, this process has now changed. Oh. Um, we're now just going to give you one surgical mask per day or for the week, right? Do you, I mean, honestly, we remember all of that. It was a huge, huge struggle. All right. 
so what are your highest priority HAIs and or condition initiatives? So the magenta color is pre-pandemic and the gray is during the pandemic. So CLABSIs, they went from 46% of a priority to 18% of a priority. CAUDIs, 17% of priorities to 9%. C diff 53 to 25, SSIs they went from 48 to 20, peripheral bloodstream infections 10 to 8, and then MRSA from 45% to 17%. So you're seeing a significant decrease in those priorities um, for HAIs, and that's because when you're in a an emergency response type of setting you have to start plugging the holes so that the, si the ship doesn't sink. And whatever needs immediate addressing, right? Is it immediate and is it urgent? If it's immediate and urgent, we need to get, get it taken care of today, right? Um, so when you're in this type of response setting, there is such, um, there are so many competing priorities that you have to really do a good job at identifying, well, what, what do I need to get done today? because I can't do everything today. Um, and I think it was at that point that some of these priorities um, started to shift and continue to, you know, continue to be an issue. So challenges, we have an increased workload and demands related to the COVID-19 pandemic response. We're increasing our work hours to meet surveillance demands and pandemic planning, education and policy review and distribution. How many of you are actually like working more than 40 hours a week. Let's be honest. Don't laugh, Charles, don't laugh. <laughs> I have you working 60 to 70. Yeah, that's not unheard of. I'm getting a lot of yeses, all right? 100%, there are a lot of us who are working way more than 40 hours a week. I can tell you, I can tell you right now that I have, wa I have worked through surveillance while watching Pride and Prejudice multiple times this week alone, right? Is Pride and Prejudice one of my favorite movies? Yes, absolutely, right? Um, but it still takes a lot of our time. Um, and not only like when you get home from work, um, but also on the weekends, right? Who gets phone calls on the weekends? Who gets texts in the middle of the night who um, I know definitely somebody in this room my colleague Charles got a call from 3 a.m. from labor and delivery so and those are you know I honestly like I love my job I really do like a hundred and fifty thousand percent so um, I don't I don't mind it but I do know that um, other people in my life do mind it <laughs> like my husband <laughs> He does not like that, that I'm getting calls um, all hours of the day. But um, this is definitely an area that IPs are feeling. And, and we increase our work hours because we want to, um, we want to provide the best to our facility, to our patients, um, and to our staff. And then you have competing priorities resulting in a stressful environment where all key surveillance and rounding activities are not being completed in a timely manner. Some additional challenges is because of the amount of time because of the amount of time we're having to spend providing uh, consults, so either answering questions, looking up policies, um, doing reviews, catching up on surveillance. Um, we have decreased device associated audits, and this is just from from a team perspective locally so maybe you feel like oh this doesn't really apply to me so if you're presenting to your leadership you can you can put your own challenges in here right um, but this is what i can tell you from from our local team so decreased device associated audits like central lines and foley's definitely not doing them with the frequency that it was done pre covid 19. Uh, decreased environment of care and hand hygiene audits Decreased, decreased audits in ambulatory and outpatient sites. And now we have increasing demands regarding to hand hygiene observations by LeapFrog. So, you know, we have that 200 observations per unit per month, that lovely thing that came out this year. So the responsibilities of our role are increasing. The demands for our role are increasing. And now we're having to split ourselves three or four different ways to try to um, 
provide the support, the knowledge, the recommendations, um, and the results that are needed for our facilities. So this is an example of how you can bring all of this information together and put something together for your C-suite and for your leaders. My recommendation is use the modified equation for acute care bed equivalence that was developed by New York. You can modify it, you can adjust it, um, but we're gonna do an example facility, right? So we have um, an acute care hospital, 317 beds, all right? The acute care beds are 267 of them. They have 40 ICU beds and 10 um, NICU beds. And so that goes from just being 50 to 100. An ambulatory surgery center that goes from just one ambulatory surgery center to 50 acute care beds. And then ambulatory clinics, seven of them. So that accounts for 70. And then we have, oh, 317 acute care inpatient beds, but really it's 487 when you do the acute care bed equivalent. You need to account for everything that you're doing, for everything that you're responsible for. Um, I can guarantee you there are opportunities within your own facilities. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's people with really robust infection prevention programs on the call, but there, there are more than likely opportunities for you to improve relationships within your acute care hospital and not just inside your facility, but also whatever um, outpatient responsibilities you have as well. So this was an idea that I got from one of the papers, the papers from Providence Health by, um, was it Rebecca, what was her name? I can't remember her name, but last name Bartles, Dickinson, and Babade, hopefully. I have the, the name of, of the paper down here. They provided to their, um, to their system a current, better, and ideal staffing model. So when we're requesting for additional staff, we have to be understanding that that's gonna take money, that's gonna take an investment. So I think it's important to provide leadership with options, right? Okay, well, currently this is what we have. This is what I think would make our program better. And then what our ideal or dream situation would be. And you may fall somewhere in between the current to better or the better to ideal. Um, but I think having options and not just saying, well, it's one new IP or nothing. Um, I think that's where um, you, you have a little bit of negotiating power of saying, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be a whole brand new IP. We have a current, a better, and an ideal staffing model that we want to discuss with you and, and show you what that would look like and how that would help us do our jobs better. And so for the example facility that I used, um, you see here the current is three full-time IPs. A better would be a three full-time IP with a part-time associate of about 20 to 28 hours. And then the ideal would be um, a full-time IP, I'm sorry, three full-time IPs, one full-time associate, and 0.5 for a technician role. And then you can even further break it down using the acute care bed equivalent to go over what those ratios would look like um, including your support staff. So including um, whether you request for an additional IP or whether you request for an associate or a technician or whatever it is that you feel would make your program stronger. You can break it down by the current model. All right, we're at one to 105. And we're counting acute care beds alone, but one to 162 if you're taking into consideration every other um, facility um, and outpatient location that we are responsible for. And then you, you can break it down even further for the better and ideal so that they have, so that they're able to really look at what those ratios would look like if they were to implement your recommendations. Now, this is a brief summary of what an IP associate and IP technician would be. Um, you know, I think the associate role has extreme potential to, to be something great and fantastic. These summaries or these salaries down here were really recommended based off Florida money. So don't don't, don't think that, that that's going to be the same wherever you're at, New York, California. You guys are on a whole different, you know, salary situation. So um, you, you would just have to compare it, um, compare, well, a type of administrative role, how much money would that make? Um, I used some of our um, 
public health salaries to to compare these types of roles because I feel that we can bring in um, people who maybe don't have experience with infection prevention but want to get experience or are passionate about healthcare, um, you know, who are going to school for public health and who are interested in infection control and this is our way of bringing them in and helping them grow within within infection prevention and it doesn't just have to be like we pulled you know this nurse off the floor or we you know we brought this person from you know the health department or we're you know we're we're shifting and switching and we can really help people grow within within our department and within our field so um yeah, well, so that's pretty much it for that. Do we have any questions? I know that was a lot. That was a lot of information, and that was a that was like the whole time basically focusing on staffing. Um, do you have the link for leapfrog hand hygiene observation requirements? I can try to find it. I know I got an Excel file sent over to me by leadership going over what those survey requirements are. Um, so you need to make sure, um, just to briefly talk about it, you need to make sure that you're getting 200 observations per unit per month and then that you're conducting observations across all shifts, so including weekends and night shifts that are proportional to the staff that work those shifts. Um, you have to ensure that um, people who are getting hired on also get uh, hands-on training on um, hand hygiene, both with soap and water and alcohol-based hand rubs. So they have to do a return demonstration. So there's a lot of different components to the hand hygiene portion of the leapfrog survey. Okay, any additional questions? Uh, this was awesome. Thank you. I'm sending this info to all of the IP directors and leaders I know. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Thanks, Jacqueline. Okay, so I've done it again. Um, I have. I didn't get to go over outbreaks, but I'll try to. I'll try to cover a little bit. We have what, like six? How many minutes? <laughs> Stop! Don't make fun of me. I try my best, but I'm very passionate. Okay. I'm very passionate about um, infection prevention. I think there's so much growth and opportunity within our programs. I really, I just think we need people who believe in us and who want to show the world what we can do. All right, so let's just quickly discuss our interim guidance, um, our interim guidance for a public health response to contain a novel or targeted multi-drug resistant organism. So this is where we left off last week. Uh, last week we were discussing outbreaks and I really thought I was going to be able to go through the other presentation a lot more quickly, but I didn't, so I apologize. But let's just go over this. So what are our goals for an outbreak response? We want to identify the affected patients. We want to ensure appropriate control measures are promptly implemented to contain the further spread, and that is important. We want to determine if transmission and dissemination is occurring, and then we want um, characterizing the organism or mechanism in order to guide further response actions, patient management, and future response. So these are some of our key definitions, our healthcare facility. Obviously, we can have an acute care hospital, an LTAC, a nursing home, or a skilled nursing facility. Uh, colonization screening. Uh, when an emerging MDRO is identified, colonization screening is recommended by CDC as an essential component of the public health response. And this is very important. So I don't know how many of you have had the privilege, um, the honor, the, the excitement of having an MDRO identified within your hospital. Um, and I'm not talking about just like, you know, just like your regular MDRO, like a pseudomonas MDRO, like something with a mechanism of resistance that's really unusual. So whether it be an OXA48, an NDM, a VIM, um, something really unusual. But one of the things that a lot of health departments are going to discuss with you is conducting a point prevalence survey or a colonization screening. So depending on the pathogen, um, so for example, let's say they found Candida auris. If they found Candida auris in your facility, it would be um, uh, swabs of the axilla, right, or the groin. So depending on the pathogen, it's going to depend what type of uh, swab, um, what type of um, specimen you would collect. A lot of the times it is a rectal swab, though, just to be clear. 
and then you have response tiers. So you have tiers one, two, and three, and which tier gets activated is going to depend based on the mechanism of resistance or how common that pathogen is within your within your region or within your county, et cetera, depending. There's a lot of collaboration between um, your hospitals and local public health. So we have tiers one, two, and tier three. So for tier one, this is going to contain resistant mechanisms novel to the United States, pan-resistant, um, and it needs more extensive evaluation to better define the risk for transmission. Um, and an example is pan-resistant OXA-23 Acinetobacter bomanii. So tier one is really, this is where you have your most novel organisms. So if you were looking at a pyramid, tier one would be at the very top. You're, this is like totally pan-resistant organisms. Like we have not seen this. Ring the alarm, um, you know, call your local county health department, let them know because it's about to pop off. Like it's popping off today or tomorrow. I don't know when, but it's going down. Like basically that's tier one, plain, simple terms. Tier two, um, it's primarily found in healthcare settings, but not believed to be found regularly in the region. Um, information is available about how transmission occurs in groups primarily at risk. And some examples are going to be your VIMS, your NDMs, your OXA 48s. So these are going to be your tier twos. And tier two is actually where um, I gained most, if not all of my experience relating to outbreak investigations. And then tier three, these are already established in the United States and have been identified in the region before, but it's not endemic, meaning um, there are places in Florida where Klebsiella pneumoniae is endemic. Um, sorry, not Klebsiella pneumoniae, KPC, KPC. Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase, KPC is endemic, but there are other areas where it is not. Um, and at that point, um, you would have, you know, it, it would meet for a tier three. So if you have, like for example here, Finding a KPC is not that big of a deal, but if it's like a smaller county where a KPC is not regularly identified, it would be a big deal because that's definitely a mechanism of resistance that you don't want colonizing your facility um, or you know your county at that point. Information is available is available about transmission, and then oh, they the example they used is KPC interba interbacteriaceae producing Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase. All right, so strategies specific to tier two, and um, tier two is the one that I like to focus on because I feel like this is the one that most people run into. Um, I have never worked a tier one outbreak, only tier two. Uh, so after identification, prompt notification to the patient's primary caregiver, patient care personnel, other healthcare staff per facility policies, procedures, and local and state health departments as required. There's implementation of appropriate infection control measures, informing the patient and family, uh, screening culture of index patient after one month has passed since initial culture was collected, and then conducting a healthcare investigation looking at exposures over the preceding month. Strategies continued, conducting a contact investigation. Yeah, this is really important. So cultures of epidemiologically linked patients, uh, screening additional patients is dependent upon whether the index patient was on contact precautions, contact precautions or not during the entire stay. And then environmental cultures in these situations are generally not recommended unless transmission is identified or suspected. So I know environmental cultures are, I feel like, really fun, but they're not always necessary. Uh, implement a system, they're also very expensive. Um, implement a system to ensure adherence to infection control measures. So education, adequate supplies, monitoring adherence, there's a lot of stuff. So here are some examples of um, patients with NDM and, and in the United States, so really seeing uh, that you have a lot of NDM that has been reported, but please keep in mind that a lot of these cases are, are low. So for example, Florida was ranked seventh with 10 reported cases at the time. Here we have Florida being ranked eight for OXA 48 with five reported cases. So they're, they're seen, we've identified this these different types of, um, of mechanisms of resistance in the US, but they're not common. They're not commonly found. And then for VIM, we were third with 12 reported cases. All right, so um, 
I'll go ahead and cut off here. So the remainder of the presentation was really to go over outbreak response. So it's a lot easier to go through an outbreak, talk about it, work through it together, um, and be able to, to really discuss it and what it looks like um, than it is to just to just read about it. But what I will tell you is that everything that I was getting ready to discuss is available here. This was a presentation that was done by my colleague. So Danielle Rankin, she's amazing. She's doing her PhD at Vanderbilt. I feel like I say that at least once a month, but that's just because I'm so proud of her. She's amazing. Um, but this is one of the presentations that she did, and it really went over the outbreak that we worked together um, of VIM producing Pseudomonas aeruginosa in a long-term acute care hospital. And we'll provide you a really good overview of different interventions that we did from a public health perspective. Um, on, on slowing down this outbreak and eventually um, and eventually being able to close it after a year and a half. So if it, it was a very long time. One thing that I will like to point out, which is really important, is the environmental environmental sampling ferry. So one of the concepts that I want to make sure that you have ingrained is environmental sampling is not always necessary and not recommended unless you're doing an epidemiologic investigation, right? So when I was part of the team um, with the VIM outbreak in Orange County, when CDC got there and it, they sent an amazing, fantastic team, they're just, all of them are amazing, okay? Um, I have so much respect for their team, for Dr. Walters, for um, everybody, uh, Dr. Glowix, Heather Moulton Meissner, she's amazing. Um, but one of the things that I remember, I, I was like, oh, well, I wonder if we can swab this and if we can swab that. Um, like I was just kind of thinking and talking out loud because I was so excited about having the opportunity of swabbing and potentially identifying a source for the outbreak. Um, and I'll never forget, it was, um, it was the laboratorian that was a part of the team, Dr. Meisner, and she told me, you always let the data guide your sampling. You don't just go in there and you swab whatever you want to swab. What type of risk factors do these patients have? Did they did they all have vents? Were they did they all get dialysis? What what overlaps in their care to to where we could potentially identify a point source or a source of contamination? And I have never forgotten that. I have never, ever, ever forgotten that. She said that to me, and I, to this day, I still remember it because I think it is so important. You always let your investigation and your data guide your sampling. So even though it's really exciting, remember, you do not want to be the environmental sampling fairy and just going around collecting swabs from everywhere. And this is um, also highlighted in this, I, APIC um, slide where generally microbiological environmental sampling is not recommended because it is costly, requires special laboratory procedures, there is no standard for comparison, and may result in the implementation of unnecessary procedures or treatment, right? So if you go around swabbing all over the place and then you get positive results, at that point, what do you do? What does that say, right? That's why you always have to let your investigation and your data guide you. Um, so I think that's pretty much it um, for today. You guys can read more about our outbreak um, and, and listen to her whole presentation um, online. It's recorded and that's pretty much it. And then this is me back in the day, uh, not really back in the day, just a few years ago, <laughs> 2017 um, and Danielle, it was me and Danielle. This was, um, this is our, yeah, we're very proud of all the work that we did for this outbreak. So. Um, she's amazing. I hope she's doing well. I need to call her. She called me. I need to call her back. But anyway, that's pretty much it, guys. I know, very long day today, but um, that's it. Does anybody have any last minute questions before I send you all off to have a wonderful weekend? Anything I can answer? There's lots of thank yous. You're welcome. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the box. Um, remember that you have the handouts available to download and that's pretty much it. So thank you guys and have a good weekend.